Um, all right, well, welcome to the DDPS seminar, everyone. Before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics. Uh, first of all, please mute yourself during the talk unless you have questions. If you have questions, you're welcome to unmute and ask. Otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Second, today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences. Uh, therefore, no classified discussion is allowed. Please watch out. Uh, finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel. That's about it. Now, let me introduce our speaker today. It is an honor to host Sergey uh, Tratyak, uh, who is a T1 deputy group leader in the theoretical division of division at Los Alamos National Lab and Los Alamos National Lab fellow. He received his master's degree in physics in 1994 from Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology and his chemistry doctorate in 1998 from the University of Rochester. He was then a director funded postdoctoral fellow uh, from 1999 to 2001 and subsequently became a staff scientist at uh, Los Alamos National Lab and a member of the DOE funded center uh, for integrated nanotechnologies. Uh, Sergey also um, serves as an adjunct professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara from 2015 to present and at Skolkov Institute of Science and Technology in Russia from 2013 to present. He became an American Physical Society Fellow in 2014 and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry in 2019. He has also received the Humboldt Research Award in 2021, the Los Alamos Postdoctoral Distinguished Mentor Award in 2015, and the Los Alamos uh, the Fellow Prize for Research in 2010. His research interests include development of electronic structure methods for molecular optical properties, nonlinear optical response of organic uh, chromophores, non adiabatic, um, the dynamics of electronically excited states, optical response of confined ex excitants uh, in. Con conjugated polymers, carbon nanotubes, semiconductor nanoparticles, mixed hailed um, perovskite, and the molecular aggregates. The use of machine learning and data science toward modeling electronic and chemical properties. Triac has published more than 300 scientific publications, cited more than 20,000 times, and he has presented more than 300 invited and keynote uh, talks in the US and abroad. Today, Sergey uh, will give a talk with the title of Machine Learning for Materials and Chemical Dynamics. Uh, please expect a wonderful talk uh, from him and enjoy it, of course. Now, without further ado, let me pass the button uh, to Sergey by asking one random question. Um, the question is, what is your favorite things to do other than research? Oh, other than research, remember that I'm living in Los Alamos in New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico is a land of enchantment, and there are three favorite things uh, for one to do in the northern New Mexico, which yeah. is biking, okay. I'm a mountain biker, skiing, downhill skiing, yeah. and hiking. So those are three favorite things that I like to do. That, that, the land. that sounds very good. I mean, and sounds very healthy. So I guess it's good for you. So. I can name a fourth thing. And actually, uh, my mentor, Jean-Luc Breda, he is a big professor in uh, Arizona. At yeah. one point, he visited Los Alamos and um, he looked at me and said, well, why don't you do the real chemistry? Because yeah. I'm a theoretical chemist. Yeah. And then, uh, since then, I start brewing beer. So that's a real experimental chemistry and it's fascinating to do. Every day you, you do. No, 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 not, not every day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sounds good. The stage is yours. Yep, thank you so much, Yansu, for a kind introduction. And it's an order to uh, present a DDPS uh, seminar. And 
uh, let me start with introducing uh, some research topics that I would be happy to discuss offline that typically uh, my team is interested in. So for many, many, I'm theoretical chemists, uh, as I mentioned, and for many, many years, we have been looking at the dynamics of excited states. When you initiate joint electron phonon dynamics and you have a fascinating evolution of the wave function, as you could see on those movies, and in this evolution, the electronic energy migrates to ionic degrees of freedom and back. And as a result of this dynamics, you could describe those phenomena such as energy and charge transfer, and then you could build something like uh, effective model for description of uh, energy and just uh, charge transfer. As Yon Su was saying that I'm a member of SYNT, Center for Integrative Nanotechnologies, and there we are looking at various nanosystems. For example, uh, as you know, that quantum materials have been uh, latest push toward exciting technologies, and we have been looking at uh, functionalized carbon nanotubes where the chemical group is attached to the surface of the nanotube, and this makes them a quantum emitters so that those nanotubes can emit uh, very pure light. A similar development has been going on in the land of uh, quantum dots, where the semiconductor nanocrystal uh, becomes a quantum emitter, which is possible to use, for example, for quantum information transduction or just to make an um, optical quantum computer. And of course, perovskite uh, materials have been a recent newcomers as a functional materials used for a number of technologies. I will name a few such as uh, photovoltaics, lightning. Um, in, in Los Alamos, we have been particularly interested in using perovskite materials for detection purposes such as gamma ray and x-ray detectors. And of course, over the past uh, five years, we have been very interested in pushing the methodology forward by invoking data science and machine learning. And this part would be a subject of my today's talk. Uh, this is my plan for today. So first of all, I will briefly introduce to machine learning approaches and their challenges as you apply them to chemical and material systems. Then I will skip perhaps like a decade of development all over the world and talk about uh, some recent development and in particular answer the question, how do you make your database from which you are learning? So I'll talk about active learning strategy on an example of aluminum force fields. Then I will uh, introduce into a major drawback of the current machine learning framework, which is uh, locality. And then I'll outline some recipes how we can potentially overcome this uh, uh, fundamental locality limit and describe non-local effects for charge systems, such as anions and cations, and for excited states. So let's go ahead along this plan and essentially I'm not going to introduce you in machine learning and the famous example is how you examine the photograph and pixelated image and come up with the input of a dog. And in the course of my uh, presentation, I will be solely focused on the neural networks, more specifically convolu convolutional neural networks where you are parsing the information through the layers of the networks and at the end of the day, you have something chemical on this side, and then you are trying to assign a label which would be a desired property on that side. So let me just introduce to you a big picture. A chemist's perspective on the material science. You start with atoms, then you make a bonds, come up with molecules, nanoparticles, 2D, 3D structure, and much larger systems such as polymers and biological systems. So that you could see that there is a clear distinction between local properties, such as bonds, energy, charge, atomic charges, and global properties. What is the total energy of your systems? What would be excited state? What, how the electronic density is distributed? 
what is spectroscopic properties, how you could uh, manage energy and charge transport in this uh, in those systems. So that's where the machine learning can come handy when you are going across the array of materials. And then the question is, can we outsmart conventional quantum chemistry? Will artificial intelligence or ML be an answer for cutting the corners? And most importantly, what would be the technical ways to address the observables, such as energies, dynamical propagation, parameters, Hamiltonians, and so on? So, again, so to, like, to introduce you to the land of theoretical chemistry, there is a speed versus accuracy gap. If you are trying to solve the quantum equation, such as Schrodinger equation, then the exact solution will cost you an exponential expense with respect to the system size. When you go down in apply some approximation and DFT is one purple in quotes first principle approximation, of course, you could just downscale your expense to maybe like n in the power of three. On this side, on this side, there is a classical coarseness where we forgot the quantum mechanics and use the simple model when you have balls on the spring. However, in this on this side, the error is large, and on this side, the error is small. And what we would like to achieve with machine learning is to embrace both sides to cut the corner. So now. Let's talk about a simple example, molecular dynamics. To do the classical molecular dynamics, let's say in the Bond-Oppenheimer regime, you need to solve the Newtonian equation of motion, where the main thing would be the gradients, the forces acting on a particular atom. You can then get those gradients as a derivatives, of course, of the energy, and the energy you could get from the solution of the Schrodinger equation. That's where the expense for quantum mechanical simulations is coming into the picture. So now we are asking, so in principle, how can we bypass the quantum mechanical simulations? And one way to bypass it would be the classical force field, which enable millions of atoms of simulations versus hundreds of atoms. If you are using the quantum force field in the land of so-called uh, ab initio molecular dynamics. So again, so to like, we're trying to utilize machine learning, and in particular, I'll be talking about supervised machine learning, when we have a set of inputs and the set of variables, we are learning the unknown functions, and we are training this unknown function to the predescribed data set. And once the, how we are getting to those data set would be a major subject of my talk. And of course, the supervised machine learning has been used for multiple tasks, such as regression and classification, many applications. I already showed you the image recognition, and there are multiple examples of algorithms. So just to cast this in the context of chemistry, our structure would define us as descriptors, whereas the properties would be defined as the labels. Again, so we are passing this through the neural network. And of course, we would like uh, to train so that our neural network will perform accurately. So prediction versus reference benchmark. And then we are using those neural networks to simulate some desired physical properties such as spectra. Okay. So, but what is most missing in this picture? That would be so-called extensibility and transferability tests, which are extremely important. So as the extensibility means that if you are training on the data set that is generated for small system, let's say it's for small molecules, you're asking the question how well your neural networks will perform for much larger system, for much larger molecules such as protein. And the second question is about transferability. For a chemist, I would say, what if you are training your neural network for one molecular family, such as non-aromatic uh, compound, and you would like to transfer your neural network to perform for aromatic compounds, which are very different systems? 
Will you get any useful results? Of course, this is a big question to answer and answering to these questions to some extent is extremely important before you start jumping into uh, simulations of the properties. Again, sort of like this is another picture that is showing the big picture that we need to establish the relationship between structure and property. And now let's go into the um, specific recipes how one can, we can do this. So typically, once you start uh, the applying the neural network in chemistry, you entertain the idea of locality. Let me have uh, this simple equation that you have a property and it could be anything. For example, like total energy of your system. And then you are presenting this property as a sum of the individual energies of your atom. Okay, and this underpins the idea of locality. And then how you can do that? You entertain concept of effective atoms in the specific chemical environment. So this is a molecule you associate uh, with each nuclear center, some effective atoms, take into account the effect of immediate chemical environment subject to a certain cutoff. The certain cutoff would be on the order of about five angstroms. And why five angstroms? The answer is that you need to go beyond the length of the typical chemical bond. Remember that we are talking about chemistry and Chemists are saying that the old chemistry is local. Okay, so now uh, then I will go beyond this uh, uh, thing and then discuss two specific properties, two specific things. One is how we can construct a proper training set by embracing both chemical space. Chemical space means that if you change one molecule to another one. And conformational space. And conformational space means that if you are making dynamics on the molecule and the molecule goes through some kind of reaction barrier, which sort of like entails the uh, change of the structure. And then the final ch challenge would be how we can overcome the locality approximation, the central idea in the building the neural networks. So the fundamental idea came from the seminal work of Baylor and Parinello. They were first to construct this neural network when they said that the energy of the system would be a sum of the energies of individual atoms. And each individual atom is described by its specific uh, neural network that is trained. And remember that I showed you a picture of the photograph of the, the of the dog. So similar like you pixelate the picture, you describe the atom with atomic environment vector. And this atomic environment vector will usually uh, include radial description and angular description. So the radial description means that it gives you an information what are the atoms in the neighborhood. And angular description gives uh, what are the angles. And of course, uh, the angle give you some kind of uh, implicit information about chemical bonding for a given atom. So this was the original Baylor and Parinella uh, neural network. And after that, there have been almost two decades of uh, development, maybe 15 years. And during that, those neural networks have been complicated a lot. And in Los Alamos, we have been helping to develop and improve several types of neural network, which are essentially some adapted versions, like what is published by the big companies such as Google, like TensorFlow, and so forth. So the first one would be any family, which is a modified Baylor approach. The second one would be Hip and N family, which was developed by uh, Hipton Barras and Nick Labert at Los Alamos. And the main feature would be interacting layers. And the third one would be AMNET by OLSSI, which features a self consistent loop. So, any family was developed by originally by Justin Smith and Adrian Rodri. And Justin was a postdoc at Los Alamos, and now he's happily working at NVIDIA. So, we are suffering from this sucking up the talent from uh, 
National Labs universities to the uh, industrial companies. So anyway, I will uh, talk a little bit about those ones and just I'll give you the, some big pictures by saying this was the original um, Baylor and Perinella and this type is uh, Kipanean and this one would be AMNET. So you could see there are lots of things that is going on inside of the neural network and I will describe in my talk some of those things. Okay, now, first of all, let's talk about databases, because if you are uh, uh, going on the land of machine learning, the databases make a critical difference for the quality of your product. So, and surprisingly, we have been using so-called ensemble disagreement, where it's a very simple approach, which is showing you where on the face space you have a lack of training. So let's imagine that instead of a single neural network, you are training several neural networks. And then you run the dynamics in parallel across those neural networks and see whether the answers are agreeing to each other. And in general, if the answers do agree, then we conclude that the neural networks had adequate training and this phase space is covered. If the answers disagree, then perhaps we need to add more points. So this general principle serves for uncertainty quantification, which is critical for training. And also it underpins the active learning approach, which is helping to automate this process. So what it means is that just imagine that you have, let's say the CPU cluster and GPU cluster. GPU is running a uh, neural net dynamics and CPU is doing a uh, reference quantum mechanical simulation. So that neural net after several cycles are asking CPU to produce more data and CPU is producing more data, there is a retraining of the neural nets, more dynamics, and the new data is requested. In fact, sort of like you can just go away and in a week uh, time, you could come back and gather your hopefully improved uh, neural net. Okay? So, um, again, sort of like the active learning is allowing us to undercut and optimally choose the data set. So just this approach is, uh, this is Kisney plot for uh, several data sets. QM9, we are starting from molecular systems. QM9 is a data set of the small molecules which are in the, gr uh, in the ground state. Anyone would be those molecules which are stretched along the conformation. So it's a dynamically induced uh, data set, which was obtained by stretching along the normal mode. So here we have 50K of species. Here we have 20 millions of species. And now if you are using uh, the active learning, then 20 millions can be reduced to uh, about 5 million. So that without any, uh, negative effect to the quality of the training sets. And then one could just analyze those Kisney plots and uh, see some type of typical chemical bond, uh, bonds that you could see in those molecular systems. That's a principle for active learning. And in particular, active learning becomes uh, very important when you're trying to transfer from low fidelity method to the higher fidelity method. And that could be sort of like, I'm not going to talk about this one, but it is possible to do. And then you need to use active learning here and there. So let's talk about Livermore. We are happy enough to occupy Sierra for a couple of months before it went to the production. And as you know, so you're hosting Sierra uh, and this is a uh, number one on the top 500 list. Or to, number two on the top 500 list, yes. So we have been using Sierra and occupying almost the whole thing by trying to develop the aluminum interatomic potentials. Namely, what we have been doing, we have been starting from melts, namely a random arrangement 
of the aluminum atoms in the periodic cell. So that the density functional theory has been calculating those. And of course, you need to just to throw away some unphysical arrangement. For example, when the atoms are way too close to each other, those are, would be unphysical. So that this way, you start with the principle that you don't know anything about this. And you would like to learn not only the non-equilibrium dynamic, but also you would like to learn the equilibrium conformations. So at the end of the day, once you accomplish this active learning uh, uh, cycles, many cycles, so that it was done, was done completely automatically without human intervention, sort of like hands-free approach, and then you start seeing and visualizing what is going on, then you could uh, sort of like identify what are the preferred uh, crystal uh, stable crystals, what would be the liquid phase, what would be the shock configuration and highly disordered configuration. Okay, so that's a principle. And then of course, at the end of the day, you take those data, you take those interatomic potential, which would be the machine learned force field, and you conduct massive molecular dynamics on your laptop, because you are now down to the uh, linear cost of uh, simulations, and this has been done on the laptop. And uh, at the end of the day, sort of, uh, um, you have this uh, shock formations, and uh, this is about 1.3 million of uh, aluminum atoms uh, uh, simulations. So now, that's how you gather the data. What would be the future approach for gathering the data? How do we sample the phase space where we want? This is learning of unknown. Think about catalytic reactions. Frequently, when we are talking about catalysis, and I'm really happy to see that now we are pushing toward green energy, to the, towards the hydrogen economy. And we are, when we are talking about catalysis, it's all about learning what, uh, what is happening to the energy barriers. And frequently, we don't know where those energy barriers are. And the question is, how one can pinpoint and learn adequately from the, ener for the energy barrier? And here we have been recently developing two ideas. One was the active learning combined with the transition path sampler. So you have reactants and you have products, and you could use something like nudge elastic band to pinpoint one path through the barrier, and then you use active learning to sort of like sample the phase space around the barrier to learn a force field to describe some kind of catalytic reaction. And the second would be a bias dynamics where your uncertainty will push you toward a known phase space. Those would be an important improvement on the land of uh, uh, machine learning. Okay, so let me move on and address the second topic of my talk is how to overcome the locality challenge. Now let's talk about first about charge systems. When I'm talking to, uh, to my data science colleague, I was challenging. So for example, I'm asking the question, what if you have a bucket of material and I drop a single electron there. Where would this electron end up? In which corner? And how delocalized this electron would be? Even on the level of a simple molecule, when I'm dropping the electron, whether the electron would end up on the right side or on the left side. And maybe if when you start rotating around the bond, which is in the middle, at some point, the delocalization of the electron will change and the electron would be delocalized completely over the molecule. So, again, sort of like those are important questions and they are in green energy technology or um, some uh, electrochemistry. Ionization potential, that's the energy to take uh, away the electron or electron affinity, the energy to add the electron. Uh, some kind of main properties. For quantum chemistry, we are usually using DFT flavors. In experiment, you are using cyclovoltometry. Now, if you would like to start learning about electronic properties, then you need to 
discretize the electronic density. Remember that the electrons are making a cloud around the molecule. So this is a molecule that's your electronic density, which forms the electrostatic potential, which is relevant to all those charge states. Now you would like to discretize this density and you would like to assign the point charge to every atom. And remember those point charges underpin virtually all uh, classical forces. But there is no charge partition in schemes and those, those uh, things are ill-conditioned. Again, I can go in depth into this uh, question, but for now let's think about that. Let's say that one needs to be, take care about this partition in particular. So now, here we have been using AIM, eight atoms in molecule, molecule. And with this approach, we are able to overcome the locality approximation. And the locality of the approximation is overcome by two important improvements. Number one, usually like in any type of Baylor and Anella uh, type of things, we are starting with atomic environment vector and end up with energy. So here there is a feedback loop to the atomic feature environment, which is updated several times. Think about it as a mean field loop or self-consistent loop that you are using some, somewhere like in Hartree-Fox theory or density functional theory. However, in this case, there is no variation of principle and there is no guarantee that it will ever converge. But as a result, after two or three iterations, you are improving your answer quite a bit, particularly for non-locality things. When, you remember, this non-locality, when the electron is not sort of like ending up on the atoms, but they becoming uh, local, uh, delocalized somewhere else. And the second thing is to introduce the atomic weight factors, underpinning the idea of neutral spin equilibration. Those atomic uh, weight factors are in fact can be associated to the weight how this particular atom is participating in this uh, delocalization. Okay, so and then we apply this thing and try to uh, learn the distribution of the charges on the molecule. This is uh, our air molecule beyond the data set that uh, has been trained. Now we have anionic species and cationic species. That's how your spin density is delocalized. Of course, when we have a cation, then the electron is delocalizing. Here, the hole is delocalizing. Now, this would be your um, individual charges with the uh, color, which are color coded. And this would be your so called NBO charge partition, partitioning scheme. I won't go into the details, but this would be my reference GFT data to which I'm comparing to. Okay, so this guy. And now when I'm starting from an ion cation, the originally my neural network does not know about non-locality and distribution of the charge. But once you start doing this self-consistent loop with the weight factors, at the end of the day, you're learning them properly. So that you do a, a various states, the extensivity, extensibility, transferability, but, and you get approximately 4K cal per mole accuracy for ionization potential and electron affinity. And in fact, if you start comparing your reference ground truth or DFT simulation to even better ground truth, which would be an experiment, then the difference would be on the order of 10 to 20 K per mole. So, which means that uh, machine learning is already able to overcome the DFT error bar. So now, once you do that, you would like to do some applications. You could apply the conceptual DFT, which deals with uh, electron negativity, with chemical hardness, electrophilicity, Foucault indices. And just one thing, so for example, one could just look at the electrophilic uh, reactions. And those electrophilic reactions are frequently underpin the drug development, and many industrial companies are interested in this. And in fact, one could do quantum mechanical free radio selectivity prediction for the data sets, which were not originally in the training set for the machine learning. 
And in fact, those predictions are on par with the best prediction of models that have been using at least partially the quantum mechanics. So this is sounds very uh, encouraging for the success of machine learning in such complicated phenomena where you always have delocalized uh, charge dynamics, which involves some region of space, which is impossible to describe with the usual local approximation in the machine learning. So finally, let me briefly talk about triplet states, which would be an excited state. This would be your singlet state potential energy surface and triplet state. And triplet state, for example, are responsible for phosphorescence. Triplet states are becoming uh, important for so-called TADF, thermally activated delay fluorescence, when they serve as a storage for energy, and then you could extract the storage and use it for the light emission. But it, what is most important is to describe those transition energies, singlet to triplet state transition, and triplet back to the singlet from its equilibrium geometry. And of course, you could just describe this in terms of the regions of conformational space, which are relevant to those uh, geometries. And um, you start learning again on the example of small molecules. And it's not surprising that you have your accuracy for your data sets, for your validation data sets, on the order of a couple KKL per mole. So far, it's not surprising. It is expected because you are learning uh, some uh, features of the potential energy surface. So now, in a moment, I would like to do the transferability, and the transferability will fail if you are using the normal locality bound networks. So that we need again to go beyond the transferability. And here we are using so-called keep and end model. And there are again two features in the keep and end model which allow you to go beyond the transferability. The one feature would be those green bars. Those green bars are interaction layers and they describe interaction between atoms. For physicists, I can make an analogy of those green bars to the many body perturbation theory, like the second order, third order, and so forth. So this way we are making the machine learning aware that there is something else beyond this limitation sphere of the radius of five angstroms. The second important thing would be again assignment of the weights so that you have those local energies and you're assigning the weight to those local energies, which is a learnable for, uh, quality. So that we'll come to the physical interpretation of those weights in a moment, but in fact that we are learning those weights and this is a participation of a given atom in the excited states. And remember that our excited states are always delocalized, which precludes the using of the locally bound uh, approaches. So now, when I have been talking about transferability, this is what I mean. This is our training set. Training sets are always some small molecules up to like 15 uh, non-hydrogen atoms, and most of the molecules are non-aromatic. If you are talking about practical application of the triplet states, then we are talking about phosphorescence and mostly aromatic compounds, which has many benzene rings fused together so that the aromaticity extends over the large length scales. And in fact, sort of like uh, we have this uh, aromatic compounds where non-locality effects would be uh, extremely important. So now, remember the test set was the small molecules, extensibility test was large molecules, non-aromatic molecules. 
And if you will use the usual TPN where the locality effects are pronounced, then you won't get any good result as expected for aromatic compound. But if you are using TPN lock where you are using those weights, then the results improve, even though we don't have particularly good accuracy, and our accuracy is 10k kcal per mole versus reference DFT. And I remind you that the reference DFT usually versus experiment has uh, of the same order of error. So still, the going over non-locality effects is extremely important. Now let's talk about those weights. And in fact, those weights are reflecting the distribution of the spin density over atoms. So in the simplistic jargon, we haven't doing, been doing the quantum mechanics. We have been operating just with energies that is coming from the quantum mechanics. However, the machine learning was able to infer where the density is and where the special distribution of the wave function would be. So just enjoy those movies. This is reference uh, DFT, and this is a heap lock. And you could see there is not exact, but approximate, approximate uh, consistency between those representations. So what it means to us is that uh, the distribution of the wave function is an important parameter to learn in the future. But this is fantastic. So I changed the geometry of the molecule and my machine learning is able to sort of like to predict to some extent the evolution of the charge distribution and the evolution of the um, wave function on the, of the particular excitation of the molecule. So, and where is the future? In the previous slides, I tried to demonstrate to you that coordinates and velocities of particles are not enough to describe the dynamics. Think about it, you dissociate the water. In one case, you have charged species, and in another case, you have radicals. So that those species cannot be described by the coordinates and velocity, and you need the auxiliary variables. You need to build the ML models which are electron away. If I be talking about shock distribution, which is dear to the heart uh, at uh, Livermore as well, then the shock distribution has other parameters such as, for example, like temperature. And temperature can play this role of electron away auxiliary variable. So that uh, the simulation history and memory effect are extremely important and introducing immediate direct flavors of quantum mechanics in the learning such as polarization, charge distribution would be very important for the development of future machine learning models. And one example would be charge equilibration models when you explicitly take into account the charges and equilibrate them in ML. Okay, so this brings me uh, to about 45 minutes of my talk. And let me conclude that uh, overall, in the land of uh, chemistry and material science, ML and AI approaches are here to stay. And altogether, machine learning is not an automatic procedure. In fact, it is very hard to find qualified people to do in this work because the person needs to understand the physical background and in parallel have a good understanding of the data science. The approach to your results from machine learning as a black box training. Have some healthy skepticism when you are trying to interpret the results. Uh, to me, and this term goes back to Misha Chertkov, who taught me this about 10 years ago, physics inform machine learning. One needs to build as much physical intuition into the machine learning and I try to demonstrate these examples of like introducing the weight for a particular atoms, which reflect the distribution of the wave function. Solving specific problem is the next uh, 
frontier for ML. There have been way too many uh, demonstration of proof of principle, but what if we'll take some experimental problem and try to do the ML to solve this experimental problem? And in particular, one important thing is how we can fuse the data, fuse the data that are coming from uh, quantum chemistry, quantum mechanics, and those data that are coming from uh, experiments. And those data frequently very have very different nature and different error bars. And finally, sort of like um, common standards and user friendly machine learning uh, codes are coming, and hopefully, in a few years, we'll be able to take something like Gaussian or Watts from the shelf and do those simulations using building uh, the machine learning. And some molecular dynamics codes like Sandia's uh, Lamson have already extensive sets of machine learning models and extensive set of interatomic potential there. Again, sort of like look at this. So now we could just say that the reactive chemistry is possible to describe with machine learning uh, frameworks. You could see that this uh, hydrogen will migrate. This is the reaction, chemical reaction. One could describe uh, reactive chemistry, for example, a growth of nanoparticles. This is a, a growth of the carbon structure out of the hot carbon mix at uh, like a couple of thousand temperature. So you have, uh, you have a very strong uh, uh, reactive dynamics there. This is already possible to do with machine learning. So you could see growth of uh, fullerenes or graphenes there. And again, sort of like uh, Center for Integrated Nanotechnology, Technology, great DOE uh, user facility. You are welcome to be our users. And um, Los Alamos has a very strong program uh, for students and postdocs. And finally, I need to uh, acknowledge many, many people participating in this work. There is a team at Los Alamos working on machine learning, Hickton Barras, Ben Nabgen. Justin Smith is now at NVIDIA, Anders Nicholson. Uh, Galen Graven, Walter Malone assumed the faculty position, Nick Labber, Sien Vali, and every time we have about 10 summer students. We have very close collaboration with experiment, for example, like how we can describe the shock physics, how can we describe the self-assembly of materials, and external collaborators such as Oles Isayev and Daniel Rosen. So with that, let me thank for your kind attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, it was very informative and I learned a lot. Um, so, okay, as Sergey said, let's have a Q&A session. Um, if you have questions, please unmute yourself maybe, uh, or yeah, um, sure. The first question comes up in the chat room. Uh, Xiao Ting, uh, Asked, can you comment on the how many data points are needed to start the active learning process? Okay, so let's go back to the active learning. Yeah. So the answer is it depends. So if you look at the different uh, machine learning models, particularly if you are using neural networks, those neural networks frequently have about uh, 10 hundred. Uh, um, tens, uh, hundred thousand of uh, parameters. So yeah. it's uh, many, many parameters. With those parameters, you could fit everything so that uh, um, overfitting is becoming a real problem. So that to start the active learning procedure, you need just to learn to something. For example, uh, on the land of um, Say so. Let me go back to this particular picture. So here, you uh, try to use any one data data set. You start with learning about. Uh, you have five uh, million data points in this data uh, data set. Perhaps you could start with uh, like ten thousand of data points, and then augment those ten thousand to. Um, maybe to 100,000 to 500,000 using the active learning. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. I yeah. have so if, uh, again, sort of like not yet there. So if you are using something like a couple of clusters, 
If you are using DFT, then you need to augment it by a factor of 10 everything. If you are using, for example, like um, periodic boundary conditions for the aluminum, you could start with a thousand data points. Just active learning should be intimately bound to the number of parameters that you are optimizing in your neural network. How, how about, um, I, because we are actually facing, thinking about applying active learning in an experiment um, to guide experiment in with um, 3D printing um, here at Livermore in a project. So I'm actually thinking about like simpler models like Gaussian process. Mm -hmm. Do you have any experience with um, like, yeah, active learning with experiment data, which is like way, way less than the um, DFT and simulation data. Any yeah, comments so, uh, about um, this? Absolutely, absolutely. So remember here I'm talking about quantum chemistry and quantum chemistry is producing a lot of data. And we have a lot of uh, parameters in the neural network. You mentioned the keyword, which is Gaussian regression. The Gaussian regression is, uh, um, has much less parameters, so you could get away with uh, much smaller points if you are trying to fit and guide the experiment. So a better question uh, that we are that uh, should be answered right now is how to guide the experiment not only based on experimental data, which would belong to the sort of like uh, the land of robotic labs or the land of uh, materials informatics, but also to add some descriptors which are coming from molecular modeling. I guess uh, much better guidance can be uh, obtained in this case if, for example, you will introduce uh, some constraint, and uh, I just saw in the chat that the domain inform machine learning. So this would be a typical jargon that you could use uh, uh, for this research. Okay. Thank you for the comments. Okay, so um, next. <laughs> The following question is about the domain informed ML. For this case, how does one choose the best base space for a given category in molecular modeling for chemistry? Well, sort of, um, again, um, it depends uh, the, on the chemical and conformational space. And there could be different strategies. What do you want to learn? Let's say sort of you want to learn the uh, interatomic potential for um, not strongly non equilibrium for near equilibrium dynamics. Then you could may, you may start with uh, the data point for active learning, which are close to the equilibrium data point, and then expand them to the non equilibrium regime. If you are learning to the st strongly non equilibrium dynamics, such as shock physics such as reactive uh, chemistry then you need to push your active learning into those regimes so our example of um, um, aluminum uh, type of uh, uh, interatomic potential is where we started from complete uh, mass which was overkill and we had uh, like hands-free uh, machine learning only because we had uh, Sierra to our disposal. But if you look at the development of uh, interatomic potential, even when people have been using the active learning, then people usually have been starting from the crystal phases and augmented the phase space to non-equilibrium conditions. Again, domain informed knowledge is a keyword. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next question is from uh, James. Do you see the future of ML um, in the interatomic potential field being more geared towards mapping structural and chemical information directly to a black box function or more towards using ML to learn parameter sets for more physics informed functional forms such as the EAM? Well, 
those are two different schools of thought. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sort of like, uh, if I would like to do the in quotes, classical molecular dynamics by propagating Newtonian equation of motion, then in one school of thought, I'm just saying that I will use the black box type of approach and train machine learning neural nets to this uh, in a black box type of fashion, which are really hard to interpret. And one needs just to go across the extensibility transferability test. The advantage is, is that um, perhaps this black box would be a little bit more flexible and automatically will account for unknown face-to-face uh, -face when perhaps some physical um, domain like knowledge will uh, guide the learning. But again, sort of like the drawback, it's still the black box. On the other hand, you could just take from off shelf some kind of uh, uh, classical force field, and you use machine learning to uh, reparameterize those force fields. This is also valid, and we have been doing this by trying to reparameterize, for example, like um, the hydral angles based on the density functional theorem. This way, you will retain your physical picture, like very clear description in terms of like both of the strings, but this physical picture, it has a limited application to non-equilibrium condition. So I guess both will have uh, some existence in the future and both will be augmented with some auxiliary variables and it has been already done, for example, in the land of the polarizable force field. Again, it's very hard to, to say what will win, but for sure, the current classical force field that we are using right now will be displaced with force fields which will have some machine learning flavor. Okay, um, the next question is from Andre. Uh, Sergey, the performance of NN is strongly dependent on its structure, uh, for example, number of layers, etc. Same is true for the Gaussian process uh, regression. And has any work done on optimizing the uh, NN GPL for given data sets in the applications you considered? It's a very difficult question. And it's a, there is no yes or no uh, answer to this question. And frequently, all this knowledge is quite empirical. Just I will add uh, to this knowledge, for example, um, one empirical parameter would be the cutoff radius. Now, the another empirical parameter is how many um, layers, uh, neural network layers you will put there. And if, for example, we have been entertaining this for a while and at some point, we wanted to do the transfer learning. We wanted to train the neural networks to DFT data and transfer learn to couple cluster data. So perhaps I can just show you some of the pictures. Yeah, perhaps you could look at those things and um, the original uh, neural network that we have been using for DFT had about 300,000 parameters in the neural networks. And we are able to avoid overfitting by calculating 5 million points. Now for the couple cluster data, we are able to calculate only 500 points and the number of parameters would be way too many to avoid overfitting. And then sort of uh, Justin has been fixing some of the parameters except uh, letting some parameter go. Now, what would be the parameters where you will let go in the middle of the neural net or at the end of the neural net? And the fitting procedure was very different and the results were very different for the middle uh, or the last layer uh, parameters. 
So again, sort of like while people are making progress to interpretability and to a rational design of something like neural networks, but most of the current work to me has been done on the empirical basis or when people are sort of um, refer to the previous experience and to other words. There is no clear um, recipe. Yeah. Yes, Sergey, there is a um, the algorithm development on the neural architecture search, so called NAS, and the Argon National Lab is doing. Yeah. Um, so NAS is one of those efforts uh, just uh, that is trying to put some sanity in to the multitude of yeah. the neural networks that is existing in Europe, in the US, etc. Yeah. Yeah. So that might that might help. Huh? Of course, I mean when you say physics informed. Uh, uh, you mean by um, you know taking taking account you know existing physics knowledge and 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 then design the neural net accordingly, right? And so that's yeah. And sort of like there uh, are different schools of thought about it. Yeah. While I personally like physics informed learning, and I personally like to incorporate like chemistry intuition from a, a chemist who is yeah. saying this will work and this will not. Some people could argue that we need to get rid of it and to apply the approach that we have been doing for aluminum without any presumption and perhaps the ML will infer some unknown pathways or unknown phase space region which goes beyond the existing physics or chemistry knowledge. Right. Um, so yeah, there is no clear answer. That, that, uh, it, I, I guess we can go for further than that, and not, not just you know taking advantage of the intuition, but also um, if there is a um, existing first principle, um, extruding equations, for example, then if you can incorporate that into the neural net model, that would be wonderful. You know, yeah, a lot of people are talking. Incorporation of the hard physical restraints yeah. is uh, always beneficial. Yeah. All right, sounds good. Is there any other questions from audience? Like, I don't see it from chat room, but you can unmute yourself and ask directly. Yeah, we can chat. So, right. Um, I, I guess no. Yeah. Uh, well, let's thank our speaker Sergey uh, for the wonderful talk today. Um, Thank you so much for attending and thank you. Hopefully it's sort of like it wasn't so bad. And if you have other questions, feel free to reach me and I would be happy to answer or to hook you up with other members of the team so that there is an endless uh, sky is the limit to interactions and collaborations. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much again for the wonderful talk, Sergey. Um, okay, let me push the stop button for the recording.